This project was really a, a, a unique challenge for us, a unique opportunity. And from that has arisen a unique building. I remember the first visit to the site when James Sterling and I visited the old building and we all visited the site. Not at the same time, we were taken around individually. But I can remember very much uh, the original building, which w was very institutional, really quite intimidating. There were internal courtyards, which were not at all pleasant, uh, but we, we love very much the, the main building that's fronting the canal. That made a very strong impression. The rest was a very negative uh, impression. And so it, I think from a very early stage, it was part of our proposal was to do away with everything apart from the frontage building to the canal. Also, with the reading of the brief, which we were given as a basis for the competition, it became clear that there was a risk of repeating that kind of institutional bureaucratic building with this rather unique institution. And so from the outset, it was really fundamental to our design concept that we make a building that was friendly, light-hearted in a way that, that was not deadly serious and rigid. So we were keen to actually to break down, to more humanize the way that these 160 rooms were organized. Uh, then the idea came, well, we, maybe we should, rather than make one big building, uh, we should make a series of buildings using the, this main building on the canal frontage as the kind of head of the institution, and that then it, it should have these little children around the garden who w were working together. They're all connected so that people could move from one building to the other, but that they, being a part of a smaller group of offices, could, could feel a, an individuality and a personality for the place in which they work rather than down a long corridor with rooms on either side, etc. So the idea of, of breaking down the institution into a more friendly building, I, I think, came very early in the process. I, I think uh, too often it is, it's believed by architects that it's much better to have a clear site with nothing on it so that they can start afresh. Now for us, uh, I've mentioned context uh, earlier, and for us it's important to have some kind of anchor that represents or is part of the history of the city so that we can actually add to that history rather than sweep it away. The, the, the facade had a lot of damage to the stonework and we, we were under great pressure from the conservationists to repair the damage to take, to take away the pieces of stone that had been fractured and that kind of thing and restore it to its sort of pre-war condition. And we discussed at length with them the, the character and the benefit of leaving that building exactly as it was because it represented again a, a piece of the history of the city. And the fact that it, it wasn't seriously damaged, it was disfigured. But the fact that it represented a certain period for us um, added a, a layer of richness and interest to the project that was of benefit. I think also th th we felt that this part of Berlin at that time was the kind of cultural center of the western part of the city. And most of the buildings were uh, tended to be freestanding pavilions uh, the, the Museum of Modern Art by Miss van der Rohe, the Library uh, and Cinemonie by Sharoon, that, that, that they were their own building, standing in space and landscape. They were not built tight to the streets, to the edges of their sites. They were freestanding, to be viewed on all sides. And again, we felt that with this project, it was important that it should be viewed on all sides and not built tight 
to the edges of the site. And working then with these very personal individual forms, uh, we call it the stoa, which is, which is the long building along that frontage. There was the basilica, there was the castle, and there was the arena or the theater and the library tower. Working with all those buildings as a collection, we make then, we believe, very interesting edges for the building when viewed from outside. It's clearly a piece of sculpture. It's not kind of slat. So we're working with the immediate context of the cultural center of Berlin. We're working with an institution that, that, that has, emphasizes group working, in in, 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 but in individual spaces. So all of these things, really came together to influence the final uh, form and organization of the building. Um, I mean, we, we used to make the joke that, uh, that the buildings are very articulated and very, very particular, but the facades uh, have a regular grid of windows which represent the offices inside the building, rather like wallpaper that you kind of pasted onto these forms but which, because we're, we're using a constant window size and because we've actually branded the stucco, you, it, it ties together and relates these very different forms in both in plan, organization, and, and in height and section. It brings together and unifies these forms into one clear identity for the WZB. Like uh, the, the Christopher building here, which, which has the plan form of a basilica, but of course, a completely different interior. The linear building across the northern edge of the site is very likened to a stoa because of the loggia which fronts the garden so that people can perambulate up and down as they did in Greek buildings in historic times. The arena or theater building as we called it, focuses on a covered terrace overlooking the garden Again, so that that building has a very strong personality, but contains not a theater or an arena, but a whole series of offices. So, you, uh, and the, the castle that we've referred to as the, the possible future extension, that again has the plan form of the castle to, to make it distinct, have a strong character, but inside is very different from the castle. So we're using forms which are familiar but using them in a very different way from their original historic association. The office windows, the individual windows, are the same throughout all, all the, the, the different buildings. And they are they're deliberately centered in, the, in the, each of the rooms. And they're of, they are of generous proportion, both in terms of width and height. And they've been designed such to allow on either side of the windows sufficient space for either for curtains to hang through the window or for bookcases. But they're always in the center of the room so that the, it allows flexibility in terms of positioning of furniture to, to get to the light. But the surrounds, the, the, the redstone surrounds on the outside are very, they're, they're like hoods they don't, there's no sill, it's, it's the sides and the top, which again are, are to present stone on the sides and across the head only, no sill. But they, they are there to restrict the area through which the sun penetrates. It's like, like a horse wears blinkers to avoid it being distracted. So these windows have blinkers to avoid the sun or to limit the time of day that the sun enters the building. But beyond that, what they do, what they're intended to do, was actually to give the impression of a very deep, thick facade, to make people inside feel very secure because they could, they could see this depth, rather than have a window in a sheer facade where you can't, you're not aware of the ex outside of the building. From inside the rooms, you're very aware of, the, of the, what the building is doing externally. The budget for the project was fairly tight, shall we say, and so uh, it became, it was clear, I think from early on, that, that, that basically the surfacing of the exterior of the buildings would have to be stucco. 
And it, there's a, a very strong history of the use of stucco in Berlin. Well, and I think in Germany generally, our experience in Stuttgart and Dusseldorf, etc., was that it, it's a common material. But it's usually in these in Germany, it's usually grey, uh, dark grey, light grey, dirty grey. It, it's uh, and we felt that that really just to repeat that kind of colour uh, scheme was not going to provide the kind of identity that we were seeking. And so we know from our travel experience that in, in other countries, in Italy, in places like St. Petersburg or Helsinki, the stucco there is, uh, it, it is celebrated because you can apply paint to it. It's not a natural material. It can be painted, so you have a wonderful palette choice of color that, that you can use. Uh, and so the, the colors for the WZB were, I suppose, a kind of synthesis that was influenced by our wish to bring color to the building, but also based on other places where we think it was much more interesting and much more alive and therefore much more friendly. Well, I, I, I began working for James Sterling after he had um, dissolved a partnership with James Gowan. The pair of them started the practice together. They then split in 1963, and Sterling asked me to co work with him. And that was because at that time, uh, my strength uh, was, if you like, of a technical nature. And our, our initial relationship was that, that James Sterling was the artist and I, I was the technical um, support, basically. That was, that was the relationship. But then, over the years, that changed uh, quite dramatically, uh, such that we, at the end, were, were equal partners in for the last 10 or 12 years of our, our partnership. But the, the, the relationship evolved. He more and more took ideas that I had developed and we would work together, again, on this process of looking at different ways of designing a project, of these different strategies. I would come up with some strategies, he would come up with others, we would pull them, and the editing would take place across that spectrum. So that's how we, we worked together. And, and he... He, res he re retained the design veto. So in other words, if we got to a position where there were two of these solutions that we had narrowed the field down to, and they, that one was his and one was mine, and they appeared to be both equal, uh, and we got to then into a discussion about which was the best, he would then decide. He, he had the final, final say. But that, 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 that was the only difference between us, actually, is that if we got into that, that sort of deadlock, he, he, he would get us out by whatever he wanted to do. Uh, and so it was a relationship of mutual respect. We never allocated one part of a building to one partner and another part of the building to another partner to do everything in those particular parts. Everything came along together. If we talked about door handles, uh, for example, we would discuss different ways of, of dealing, first of all, choosing to handle. And second of all, uh, the, the best way, the best way to, to fix it, to locate it, etc. We, we would discuss it together. And then there would be an agreed solution. And that would, that's what would happen. The same with uh, handrails on the staircases or windows. All of those elements would be the result of a discussion. Color was another strong um, aspect of discussion in the office. But again, we would make, there would be, for example, for the facades of the WZB, which currently are pink and blue, also in bad, there are at least six variations of that, and there are color studies of, of, of different combinations. So that again, uh, he would do three, I would do three, we'd look at them together, and then choose which we thought was the best. So that, that was the way we worked. So it is impossible to go around the building and say, that's me, that's him, or that's somebody else. I mean, he was a very private man. Um, it, it, strangely, I mean, he, 
he was very private in the office. Uh, we used to play music. We used to play um, Bach and Mozart in the office most of the time. It was a very kind of relaxed but very calm, calm atmosphere. And we, we would talk, um, at, at, but it was always on a, on a, a very strict professional basis. Outside the office, he was a completely different person, much more gregarious, outward going, much, in a way, much more approachable. And I remember very clearly, we used to fly, we did several projects in the States, and we used to fly to the States together. And it was in, in the plane, it was a whole, it was a completely different world with him, which was, initially was quite disconcerting, but then, I learned that, that he, he would only talk in professional circles about architecture. He wasn't interested in anything else, but just about architecture. But outside, we would talk about all sorts of things, the Beatles and other music and, and, and that, that kind of stuff. So he was, in a way, a fairly complex person, but, but somebody who I think was, was very responsive to any kind of architectural ideas and input. So it, for, for me, I mentioned the transition between the relationship of the artist and the technical man is that I learned my education, my architectural education was very technically orientated. But I learned through the initial years, well, all the years of working with Sterling, I learned to appreciate the importance of the artistic aspects of the architectural profession. So I, he was a teacher in a way. But that evolved, and as I say, into a, uh, ultimately into a partnership. A design process which uh, James Sterling and I developed together, and which I have continued since his death, involves an exploration. After we've understood the brief, had our discussion with a client about exactly how the building needs to be organized and used, and we've understood the history of the location of the building in the city, we then begin an exploration of to try and find how many ways this building might be configured, not only in terms of its components and constituent parts, but also how it would relate to the outside world, to the public realm, surround the building and the city in general. And you, we often come up with many kind of solutions. Often there could be, we could find like, up to 12 ways this building could be organized in all these 12 different ways. So you end up with this kind of selection. And it's very important for us to not to arrive at, at an initial solution and then stick with it all the way through. It's important to kind of be loose, to be able to respond uh, and, and just to think almost abstractly about the ways of doing it. So you end up with these 12 variations. And you reach a point, almost invariably, where you might have three solutions that might well do the job equally, but there are, each of those solutions has weaknesses in certain aspects. Well, then the process is to find a way of grafting strong parts of one project to reconcile or, or, or to deal with weak parts of another project. So you, you end up then with with a um, synthesis of all these ideas in one strategy, one diagram, which has all the strengths and hopefully none of the weaknesses of, the, of any of the options that you've been considering. So then, th then you, you, have, you have a solution which, in a way, we found over the years, is never, can never be challenged later because you've been through this process of analysis. You've considered all the options. So very, very rarely does anything come out of the ether at a later stage that upsets that concept. And that then becomes the basis of the evolution of the design. You build on it and add, et cetera, et cetera, embellish until you, you end up with the final building. I mean, so many, so many buildings now, uh, particularly if you like office buildings, which you could turn this to be an office building, are just totally devoid of any character, both internally and externally. And flexibility is the kind of excuse for lack of imagination. 
I mean, when in, in London, and I guess in, in other uh, European cities, there, there were houses built for occupation two, three hundred years ago that are now functioning as institutions or as offices perfectly well. Uh, and they retain their character, the internal detailing of fireplaces, doors and ceilings, all those kinds of things. But they, they work very well. But what is, I think, critical in, in that example is, is that the, those houses and those spaces have a character, an identity, which people appreciate and can relate to, as distinct from a box, a glass box, which is open and flexible, boring, and completely devoid of any, any kind of personality or character that people can relate to. I have many favorite places around this building, and there are a lot of corridors, a lot of staircases, but I, I think in and the, all, all the buildings, I think, present very good vistas down the corridors. Uh, but I, I, I think in a way, the, the, pe the place I find the most interesting is the garden. I think to stand or sit in the summer in the, in the center of the garden and just, just look around at these buildings, I, I, I think it's, for me, it's magical. It, I, I, and I think for Sterling and I, the way, the way it has turned out was, was uh, far better than, even better, shall we say, than we imagined. <laughs>